Hi again, and thanks for spending time with us here on Leading Edge. I'm your host, Jeff Smith. Coming up in just a few minutes, are we about to enter a period of our economy of stagflation? And what does that mean for your money and your plans in the coming months? We'll talk about that. But first, Tom Seaman, he grew up in Toledo in the 60s. He was one of 14, and times were tough. His family relied on welfare and food stamps, something that embarrassed him in the grocery store with his mother. He earned a B.A. in economics from Yale and a law degree from Harvard. He went on to own and lead several businesses. He funded a scholarship that actively seeks disadvantaged students to attend St. Francis de Sales School here in Toledo, where he, too, got a scholarship. And that he credits that education over on Bancroft for helping him fulfill his life dream of attending a top college. I want to welcome to Leading Edge fellow knight, Tom Seaman. The book, we want to talk about that right out of the gate, is Animals I Want to See, a memoir of growing up in projects and defying the odds. Now, it's not out yet. It'll be released on May 14th, and you can find it on Amazon.com and Kindle, and the audio book drops on June 18th. He will also be part of the author series with the Toledo Main Library coming up on May 23rd. You have got a very busy calendar coming up, sir. I do have a lot. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I'm so tickled to have you here after getting through the book. You, you have been on this whirlwind tour talking about your life story. I mean, people say, Tom, tell me your life story. You literally have done it in this book. I have written the life story. Yes, there you have it. How did you get, it, how, how did you get to the point of being able to chronicle so much about your youth? Why was it important? Right. Well... I mean, the real story about it is for years I wanted to write it, but then at dinner parties and things and talking to friends, I would tell them the story and they hadn't expected that. They looked at me and probably saw, oh, upper middle class, or they created some story about what my background was. Yeah. But whatever story they created, it certainly wasn't, oh, he grew up in the projects in this giant family under these circumstances and came out of it and now he's who he is today. And then I was at an event where I met Bill Clinton. I had met him once before, but I met him for the second time. And he was very focused on me at this event. Mm -hmm. He had evidently been prepped a little bit on my story. And he loved the story because he, he too grew up poor. And he told me after hearing the story and really focusing on me, which he's famous for, he said, you have to write this book. So I wrote the book. And after I wrote the book, I went back to Bill Clinton and I said, hey, I wrote this book. Can you give me a blurb, which is a statement of support for the book? Yeah. And sure enough, he did it, and that appears on the cover of the book. He did, and we're going to show it right here. He said, quote, a terrific and moving memoir, dreaming big and making great things happen. Deepak Chopra also saying, and yes. somebody who you know also saying, read it, read it rather, and be inspired. Yes. So you're getting some big, good press, not only from friends, but also you shared with me, and I think that was much to your surprise, some of the other uh, responses that have come out from this book, the Harvard Crimson coming out and saying how they want people to read this. Right. I, that's got to make you feel good. Yeah, yeah. And others have said, you know, it's maybe a book that we need now in the sense that even though you could have made this book uh, like about, about all the sad things that happened, and some of those are in the book, yeah. but it's really a happy, uplifting book. And, and that's, true to, that's actually true to the reality of what happened. Why? I had an outlook on life that I thought I had a happy childhood mm -hmm. through all that, and I did thanks to a wonderful mother. But I also, I, I saw wonder everywhere, and I still kind of do, you know? But as you grow older, as famous writer St. Exupery said, you tend to lose your sense of wonder as you grow older. And I think one of the ideas in the book is, let's try to hang on to our sense of wonder even as we age, almost as though we're children. You know how children see everything with wonder. Absolutely. Well, I continued that until, into, into later life, but even I probably have lost some of it now, of course, but I continued that sense of wonder for quite a long time in my life. I Here, saw wonder everywhere. Here's what, here's what got me as I was going through the book, and I, and I even told some of our producers as I was reading through it, the first couple of chapters, maybe, maybe 12 chapters in, Tom, I was saddened. I was saddened as I read it okay. because, because of what befell you. And mm. while you say I had a happy childhood, I felt like it was tough. Did you not feel that way going through it? Or looking back, did you see, man, I did have some hurdles, major I hurdles. De I definitely had hurdles, and there are definitely some things that happen in the book that aren't fantastically positive. But I got up every day in the morning, and I was happy. I was all, and, I, and I still am. I I'm, I'm tend to be a very happy guy. Um, I think a lot you of You found that, joy in everything. 
I found joy in almost everything. Yeah. And, and there were some bad things that I won't mention now because I want people to read the book. Yeah. But yeah, there were some hard times, but I, I, I'm very good, I think, at letting, my wife even says this, I'm very good at letting go of things, of bad things that happen or unjust things. Mm -hmm. Un injustice particularly gets on my nerves in life, but I've had in, unjust things happen to me and I've been yeah. able to let them go and, and create happiness that way. One of the things you talked about growing up in the 60s and obviously being white, growing up in a black neighborhood, yes. and your recognition of the differences between people, right. but seeing the similarities between people as well. Right. That was important to you. Right. Well, I mean, as a child, you, I think you talk more openly about these things. So, you know, I had a really close black friend when I was quite young, and we talked openly about it. You know, one of the people that really fascinated me as a child was Muhammad Ali, so much so that one of my aspirations was to be the heavyweight champion of the world. Which even you though, talk about Even though I wasn't even a boxer, right? You know, right. I, but children have those kinds of things. I, I wanted to be the president of the United States. I wanted to be the richest man in the world. These, you know, these very difficult things to achieve yeah. because I was just a very aspirational guy. But yeah, the book starts when we move from Ravine Park Village. Those well, are I, want to touch, I want to touch back because you okay. mentioned Muhammad Ali yes. because he said disparaging things that caught your attention and you were confused by that. Right, right. So, you know, Muhammad Ali was obviously a very uh, attractive figure in that he was this champion and he, would, he spoke in a certain way that was kind of cool. Um, but then he also said things, you know, that he said, like, the white man I'm, is my enemy. Mm -hmm. And I'm this little child saying, wait a minute, how, you know, how can that be? I'm right. a fan of yours. Right. And, you know, these are sort of confusing things. And so I asked my African-American friend, you know, why are there these difficulties between black and white? You know, and of course, you know, he doesn't give me some deep answer. We're little children, but you can have those conversations more easily. Yeah. But then we, about race, when we moved from Ravine Park Village, which was, you know, also quite African-American to um, the, the North Toledo projects on Bronson Street, right. you, know, you know, definitely a new white family moving in, you know, you take a few punches, you know, for sure. But gradually you're accepted as part of that community. And the community, you know, I say about the book, it's like a collection of many small kindnesses that sort of built my life, you know. And those started in the community, right? The man across the street takes us fishing. And he's not thinking that's going to change our life. But if you add up all those small kindnesses that were done for me along the way, including yeah. gradually outside of the neighborhood as well, they built my life. The importance of your paper route of all right, things, right? Right, right. Tom, stay right there. We're going to take our first break. We're going to be back. The conversation continues right after this. Welcome back. A conversation tonight, or today rather, with Toledo native and fellow St. Francis Knight, Tom Seaman. He's about to release his new book, his first book, Animals I Want to See, a memoir of growing up in the projects and defying the odds. It drops May 14th on Amazon and Kindle and the audiobook available June 18th. I want to bring up a couple of characters, actual people, not characters. Right. It's not a work of fiction. Right. Uh, but people you mentioned who were so impactful, and I want you to tell me a little bit about them. Why? Okay. Why so? Coach Gary. Yeah, Coach Gary was my elementary school or grade school, as we call it, a grade school football coach. And... Uh, he was one of these, he was the first super energized kind of person that I met who was an adult who, you know, come on guys, let's go. And, and just all these sayings and all this energy and all this support too, yeah. in the sense that, you know, he spent a lot of time as our coach. You know, I think back now, why was this young guy, you know, not out on a date or something mm -hmm. or with his friends? Instead, he was with us, right? So he was committed to something. He convinced us, this little school, St. Vincent de Paul, in the North End, which is, you know, a little bit of a tough neighborhood, um, that we were going to be champions, you know? And we, ac we actually achieved, well, we didn't win the Toy Bowl, but we went yeah. to the Toy Bowl twice during my years there. Um, and where we started out, well, that was not going to happen, right? We had, you know, ragtag bunch of guys, crappy uniforms. We and drove, by the way, we drove up and down Bronson for you this week. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not on the part of the street that has the projects. I got you. All right, right. But interesting. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so, you were so, saying. So, yeah, yeah. So we were able to go to St. Vincent de Paul, frankly, because my mother talked to the school when we moved there because she couldn't afford to send us there. And they actually let us go for free as long as we worked at the school. So we're at St. Vincent de Paul, Coach Gary. And at one point, you know, you have to have a weigh-in for a grade school football back then. You can't weigh more than a certain amount. Mm. And I was a big kid. I was tall. I'm still I'm tall, and, um, and I weighed a lot, and so I had to lose weight for the weigh-in, and another kid had to lose weight for the weigh-in. The sweatsuit. And, yes, and so Coach <laughs> Gary buys us these rubberized wetsuit, uh, sweatsuits yeah. that we have to run in Pearson Park in Make and weight. sweat out, right, sweat <laughs> it out. And, you know, I mean, he's spending his own money on this team 
um, just such a committed guy. Yeah. So he, he's a very big factor in that litany of small kindnesses done for me along the way. There, there was one thing that stood out for me, too, as well, Tom, as I was reading through it. And, and I, I think about as a family and you know sometimes you don't see a lot of uh, PDA as the kids would call it public displays of affection right. but your mom put her hand on your back at one point during your childhood right. and it kind of struck you as odd because you had never felt that before it was it was right. a comforting moment right yeah i mean why was it important to put that in the book uh, well i think i think first of all back then uh, you know, displays of affection, like everybody hugs their kids today. When you say goodbye to your siblings, everybody hugs now. That wasn't the case back then. I think on top of that, you know, my mother was from a Germanic background. I think her parents were not that way. So I think my mother didn't show, today my mother hugs me all the time, right? But back then it was different. So it was the first time that my mother touched me in, a, in an affectionate or loving way, you know, really, that I could remember in my life. So it was... And your father it, it was, wasn't like that. Oh, my gosh, no. Yeah. My father was a very difficult man. Maybe, I don't know if we're going to talk about that or not, but he was an alcoholic who was also, on top of that, a very mean guy, mm -hmm. you know, and probably a guy that hated his own life and took it out on his family. Yeah. So, um, and you, but a lot of times. Yeah, yeah. He, you know, in one scene, he pulls a loaded gun on me and my brother, mm -hmm. you know, and we have to take it out of his hands. Yeah. You're drinking a glass of milk in the kitchen. He, he says to you, uh, you realize how much that costs? You say, I'm a growing boy, and... He blocks your way to get out of the room. Right. And you guys not come to blows, but there was a moment. I yeah. don't want to I don't want to steal the thunder of the, well, moment, the moment, but it was it was kind of your maturation process. Yeah, was it, it was not? the important moment that I think he he finally wasn't the man of the house. There was a moment where, you know, you feared him your whole life. And then there's a moment where I physically me and, and my brother, who's a year older, I think, you know, stood up to him. Yeah and sort of didn't take over, but, we, but there was a changing of the guard. Mm -hmm. And I think the second half of the family actually had a less difficult f father in some ways because he was, he was older and weaker, but he also was no longer just completely in control of everything. Possibly a turning point yeah. right there. We've got about three minutes left with Tom Seaman once again. Uh, the investment people made in me, I want to make good by that, or something to that effect, you said. Even, even yeah. what Coach Gary saw in you. There have been so many who have taken a dime on you right. and said, I believe in you. You had that at St. Francis. Yeah. Why was that so important? Yeah, I mean, I think that I felt like so many people had helped me along the way. I didn't realize it when I was young, but by the time I got to, say, St. Francis or Yale, I realized, you know, at the Toledo Public Library, there was a librarian, Don Barnett, who lit up every time I entered the library and helped me with my work. And mm -hmm. we created this bond, and he actually gave me a gift of books uh, when I graduated from Yale and when I graduated from Harvard. Um, those kinds of people. You know, he wasn't doing that to bet on me, but I felt like when I finally did accomplish a lot academically, at least, I felt like, yeah, you know, what they did is paying off in a sense. You know, they bet yeah. right on me. And I'm happy about that. It still would have been fine if it, the payoff didn't occur, but I was very pleased that it had, had occurred. You also said every act of kindness, no matter how small, makes a difference. You, you try to do that each day of your life going forward, do you not? Yeah, I think the book, writing the book made me more kind because I, looking back, I realized all these things that had been done for me. You know, I kind of realized them before, but I, when you put them down on paper, they start to add up and you see that. And so I have adopted this policy I kind of had it before, but I've really tried to adhere to it now of doing an act of kindness every day, ideally for strangers, yeah. but that opportunity doesn't always come up every day. So I do try to practice that. I think it's made me kinder. I said to you, I said most of the book is spent in your youth, and there's not a lot of talk about later in life. And right. you said there's a point to that. There was a reason for that yes. when people pick up this book and they say, yeah, right. but what does he do now? What happens? Yeah. 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 So there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, it would, you know, if you, if you started writing about my later part of my life, it becomes more of a business book, which is, I think, is a different, a different story and a different readership. And secondly, I didn't want it to be a, it, it to be a, hey, look at me kind of book. I right. didn't want it to be about, oh, I achieved this business success and made this money. Um, and by the way, I don't apologize about making money. When you're in the projects, you think a lot about money. Mm -hmm. And one of the main things you want to do is make money in life. And so that did happen. I've been very fortunate and very, very lucky and also very hardworking. Yeah. So I have achieved a lot, but I didn't want that to be what the book was. 30 seconds. Was it the strength of your mother? Was it the weakness of your father that made you a success? 
you know, both, and the book talks about that. My mother, unbelievable hard worker, just a representation of not just hard work, but going the extra mile and doing the extra thing. You know, when she made a dessert, she didn't make it really quick or simple. She went the extra mile. She would make noodles for our soup. She wouldn't buy noodles. Yeah. She would homemade noodles. But my father, he was a negative example to me. There's a point in the book where I say, the greatest gift he gave me is an example of what I don't want to be. Tom Seaman, I hope that this is a huge success for you once again. Good to see you, my friend. Well, thank you. Absolutely. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back. A big thank you to Tom Seaman. Stay tuned right here, right now. Money Matters with Billy Horn from Savage & Associates. We we're going to talk a little bit about interest rates, where they are, and how people are making it by. I, I was watching something, I guess Jamie Dimon earlier this week said we could be looking at stagflation uh, kind of like the 70s. So what should people be thinking at this moment in time? Interest rates are, uh, and inflation just eating up so much of our budget. Um, housing, which is kind of my uh, sweet spot, what I do for a living. Uh, I, my impression is people are getting more accustomed to, you know, maybe maybe rates are not coming down as quick and as fast as they want. Um, so they're adjusting their budgets. And I think more and more of their money is going towards housing, which is which is difficult, very difficult. My wife's in real estate. Houses are selling. People are finding ways and means to do it. Is it just a timing kind of thing? And are people just accepting the fact that it's going to cost them a little more than it used to to live in certain areas around Northwest Ohio, Southeast Michigan? I think more and more, uh, uh, to your point, it, people are accepting that these prices maybe are not going to be coming back interest rates are not to be coming back. They can only put their lives on hold for so long. Um, so I think you are seeing people uh, embrace the idea that if they want a house, they got to really put a strategy forward and, and prepare for that, for sure. Talk a little bit about the signals that we, we talk about it each and every day when we look at the stock market, where the Dow is, where the NASDAQ, so on and so forth, S&P 500. But talk a little bit about the Fed and what it can do going forward. Can it do anything? I, I mean, are we looking, we're already almost into May here in 2024. Is there anything significant outside of the election, or maybe the answer is the election, that will significantly change things? You know, boy, the Fed's really got a tough job here. And I think we all hope that they will lower rates. But I think if you realize how um, how uh, they could affect things to the worst if they're too aggressive on cutting rates. Um, a big rate cut right now could actually lead to higher inflation um, and just make things worse. So I think uh, the Fed has very limited tools. They've been, been injecting so much cash during COVID um, that created a lot of the inflation envir environment we're in. Um, so I don't think they're going to have as much effect uh, as people hope they will. We just have to be I guess be patient um, and um, adjust, adjust for what they're doing. Billy, let's talk a little bit about generations. And you you brought up a point to me before we started today about the 18 to 35 age group and kind of where they're falling into all of this mix, whether it be going to get a car loan and or a housing, uh, getting a mortgage at this point. And you think, are they being left behind? You know, that generation really, really worries me. Um, they're being shut out of housing for a lot of different reasons. Low inventory, prices running. Uh, they've been had difficulty saving. Their consumer debt has ballooned to record levels. Um, and I think a lot of that was payments being put on hold on things like student loan debt during COVID. Um, they spent that money in other ways, and now those student loan payments are coming back. Um, and it, it's really... Uh, it's really hurting them getting into the housing market. And that that does worry me for that generation. They've got they've got to buy a house. Um, they've got to get invested uh, to stay ahead of this inflationary environment. And they haven't. They've been left behind. Northwest Ohio, Southeast Michigan has always been a spot where people could come. People could uh, have a low cost of living. In your business, are you seeing that change? Has that dynamic changed? And how quickly has it changed? How long will it last in your view? You know, I, I still think this is the most affordable place uh, to live. 
uh, people coming in from all areas. Um, if you live here and you haven't been to other areas and see what's going on, you tend to think that prices are crazy. Um, you don't have to take a very far drive down to Columbus to see what real crazy is. Um, everything's going up in every area. Uh, it's just, it's going up a little less fast here, in my opinion. Talk a little bit about how people can make this work. We don't want to be all doom and gloom here today, but how do people, if they are in the market for a house, if they are in the market for a car, any of those big time purchases, how do they make it work right now? Yeah, it's it's planning. It's saving, um, really financially saving for this and preparing. Pre-approval uh, has never been more important than it's ever been in my 30 years in the business. Uh, you got to get a good professional on your side, mortgage and realtor. Um, save as much money as you can. Uh, right now, uh, strong offers are winning because uh, you're you're bidding against a lot of other people for limited inventory. So having a very strong offer is critical and having a plan. Boy, good insight this week. We appreciate, as uh, always, Billy Horn joining us from Savage & Associates uh, talking money matters this week. And also want to point out once again, May 15th, May 14th, rather, that is when the book drops. Tom Seaman, Animals I Want to See, a memoir of growing up in the projects and defying the odds. It is one of those reads for any Northwest Ohio, Southeast Michigan native, you will start to read through this and see the familiarity for so many things that he experienced in his life, and I'm sure you did as well. I always appreciate you spending some time with us, as always. Remember, if you missed any part of our conversation, check out the WTOL 11 YouTube page. And Leading Edge is also a podcast. We'll see you next time on Leading Edge.